All right, we're just giving it one second to load onto YouTube and then we'll get started. Okay, good. Okay, uh, good evening. Welcome to the New York Studio School's virtual evening lecture series. Tonight, we are pleased to present Sherry Mendelssohn, Musing on Muses. Thank you to everyone tuning in this evening and thank you so much, Sherry, for joining us to share your work with the New York Studio School community. This lecture is one of several that were originally planned for last spring, but had to be postponed. So tonight is very special. Sherry's exhib exhibition at Tibor de Nage has also been rescheduled and will open next week, which we are really excited to see. Um, before we begin, I would like to recognize that the New York Studio School's evening lecture series is generously supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council the Robert Lehman Foundation and many individual contributors. Please consider making a donation during or after tonight's talk by clicking on the support button on our homepage at www.nyss.org. It is a difficult time for small art institutions like ours and any contribution is greatly appreciated as it allows us to bring this content to everyone. I will introduce Sherry in just a moment, but first I would like to point out the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. At any point during the talk, feel, please feel free to type in a question and we will leave time to answer questions at the end. If you are on YouTube Live, you may also enter questions for the Q&A there. Now, Sherry Mendelson lives and works in Brooklyn and upstate New York. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant, and four New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowships. Museum collections include the MFA Boston, the MFA Houston, and the RISD Museum. She holds a BFA from Arizona State University and an MFA from SUNY New Paltz. Her show, Animals, Idols, and Us, opens at Tibor de Nage on October 29th. Now please welcome uh, Sherry Mendelson with me virtually. <laughs> thank you so much, Erin, and, um, and thank you, Sam. And thank you to the whole new school community, or sorry, to the whole student, New York Studio School community. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now. Hopefully this is gonna work. Um, go there. Okay. Um, so thank you all again for, for being here. Um, the last time that um, I was with a group of friends, um, hanging out and all crowded together in a room. It was at the New York Studio School for Kathy Bradford's talk last March. I think that was the second week of March. So I'm looking forward to the day when we can all be hanging around um, and squished together in rooms again together. Um, so I'm gonna start this talk with um, a few, um, a current show and a few recent shows, and then I'm gonna backtrack. Um, if you happen to be in Philadelphia or or traveling to Philadelphia, please um, stop in and see this, um, this show rematerialize at the Arthur Ross Gallery at UPenn. Um, for me, it's been really a thrill to show with these um, artists that I have so admired, El Anatsui, Jackie Malad, and Allison Saar. Um, and then backtracking a little bit. Um, two shows from like the last 2016, the last four years. Um, the thing as I get started that I wanna tell you about this work is, that, or the things that you should know is that um, all these pieces are, the bodies of all these pieces are made from recycled plastic. So I um, collect plastic bottles, I cut them into pieces and I either sew or hot glue them back together. And the, um, uh, the, so I'm in concert with, um, you know, in conversation with um, ancient artifacts, which I think you can see. Um, but so the pieces are not, um, I don't melt them. I don't heat them up. It's really just about finding those convex and concave shapes. And then I um, often coat them with layers of acrylic polymers and um, two-part mediums like um, 
or two part um, resins like Magic Sculpt and Magic Smooth. And sometimes I add pigments or mica powders, um, which um, the acrylics, uh, you know, sometimes alter the form, sometimes or alter the colors and the sheen. And I'll talk more about that when we get to the specifics of the pieces. But um, I started this body of work in, in 2008. And at that time, I was looking at a lot of ancient art and thinking, um, you know, looking at how these great civilizations had um, risen and then disappeared. Um, and I thought, boy, um, you know, the US, it seems like it's at this really pivotal point. Um, but in 2008, I thought like I was approaching this project with some levity because it didn't seem like it was so urgent like it does now. Um, I'm going to backtrack to talk a little bit about my history now. Um, I grew up in upstate New York and, uh, and um, I, I was never really a great student, mainly because it just never ever occurred to me to, to pay attention. But in my last year of high school, I started um, seriously taking art classes. And through, the, through art classes, everything else became really interesting. And like art was this lens that you know sort of shifted my viewpoint and um, and uh, made everything else seem um, uh, really interesting. Um, in that final year of high school, right before I was going to graduate, I was reading um, the book *The Drifters* by uh, James Michener. And *The Drifters* is about six young people that are traveling in um, North Africa and in Spain, and they're you know, finding themselves and doing drugs and having, you know, sex and having fun. And I thought like, well, that sounds much more, like much more fun than going to college. Um, so at the, at the very last minute, I decided not to go to college, that I wanted to take a big trip, but, um, you know, traveling around North Africa and doing drugs for a kid from upstate New York that, um, uh, that had never been out of the country seemed kind of daunting. Um, so I bought a round trip plane ticket to Israel and I went and lived on a kibbutz. And my idea was that I could go away for a year and, um, and have adventures, but it wasn't quite so scary. Um, and while I was on the kibbutz, um, I did a lot of traveling around in Israel and went to lots of different archeological sites, um, including uh, Mount Masada, uh, which was Herod's um, palace built um, from 37 to 31 BC. And then it was a fortress later uh, that the Romans attacked. Um, but while I was um, at this palace, I was standing on this tile floor and I was, and it was, um, you know, over like around 2000 years old at that time, this was 1979. And I was thinking like, this is amazing. This is like, I'm standing on this floor that has been around, you know, for like 2000 years and just a few years before. and um, in 1976, um, you know, we had had our bicentennial and everyone was talking about how old the United States was. And I just, you know, thought it was fascinating that, well, history just became very visceral at that point. Um, just a quick aside, while I was um, on the kibbutz, I not only traveled to see archeological sites, but I also did a lot of, um, you know, traveling just for fun. And a friend of mine and, um, and I were traveling through the Sinai Peninsula we were going down to the very tip to um, go snorkeling. And we were at this, um, we had been dropped off at this crossroads and we were waiting for um, you know, a ride. And this, this um, book page blew by um, you know, with a gust of wind and I went rounding over this sand dune to get it. And it was a page from, from the book, The Drifters, um, which is what sent me there, a true story. Um, so I came back after that year and uh, I um, went to school um, in Utica, New York. And I was standing, um, I was walking to school one day, I was standing waiting for the bus and it was just, you know, cold and raining and sleeting. And I just thought like, this sucks. And I um, transferred to Arizona State University. And uh, while I was at Arizona State, I um, fell in love with an ancient Native American art, um, including this membrace bowl that you see here. 
after school in Arizona, as Aaron said, I went to um, SUNY New Paltz and I was focusing on jewelry making and metal smithing, um, making um, mainly like these large copper bowls like you see here. Um, and I, while I was there, I was um, traveling down to the city. New Paltz is about an hour and a half north of the city. And I would come down and go to the Metropolitan. And um, because I was missing, um, you know, these other lives, I would look a lot at the Near Eastern art. And then I also was um, looking a lot at Native American art and that was influencing the work that I was making. Um, then I, uh, when I graduated, I thought, oh, I can move anywhere. There was no, nothing really calling me in any direction. And so I thought, well, if I move to New York, um, at least I'll be near the Metropolitan. Um, 1986, there was a show at the Metropolitan called Objects, um, Treasures from the Holy Land, Ancient Art from the Israel Museum. And um, I bought the catalog and I look at this catalog all the time. Um, again, one of the impetuses for, for me to move to New York. And um, one of uh, the things that I really love about these pieces is that you don't really know exactly what they're used for. Um, you know, in the, the catalog, a lot of these pieces says, these were ceremonial objects. We don't know what they, why, what they were used for. We don't know what the ceremony was. And so I just love that place where then your imagination can move in um, to these pieces. Um, because I had had a, you know, kind of more of a metal smithing, more of a craft and um, technique based um, education, um, although I had taken art classes and I always loved art history. But so when I moved to New York, I was really trying to figure out what art meant for me and trying to, you know, find my way as an artist, which, you know, is a, always a challenge. Um, and I think you can see the relationship to John Duff of my piece on the left. Um, John Duff was an artist that I greatly admired, as I think you can tell. Um, and Anna Mandietta was also an artist that I admired. And I loved her use of the body, both in its physicality, but also as a symbol. And trying to emulate that, I guess, I was um, lying on large sheets of copper and tracing my form and then cutting, out, cutting it out and um, then making these pieces that would interact with the wall. Um, skipping ahead about 10 years here to a, um, a show at Brogy Gallery. This was a spinning solar system. Um, I was playing with um, both precious materials and then everyday materials like um, scotch tape and wax paper. And uh, the fan would activate this. So as you were in, in this room, it was all like everything was spinning around and lights and shadows were all moving around the room. At the time I had been taking um, an astronomy course at the new school and uh, it was a lot of math. It was really a pretty challenging class. But the thing that I really remembered was that um, dizzying spinning feeling when I learned how fast the earth is spinning. Again, about 10 years later, I had, um, I was working at that point with uh, polycarbonate, uh, a thin plastic sheet that I was uh, purchasing on Canal Street and then um, cutting up into shapes that were interlocking. And I was thinking a lot about natural phenomena, um, clouds and fog, fractal patterns in nature, and obviously the sun. And uh, I had a show with a number of these pieces. And as I was cleaning my studio um, after the show, I had a lot of scrap plastic and I was just throwing away bags and bags of this plastic. And I just thought like, oh, this is, this is a horror. Um, and why am I buying all this plastic you know, my, in the rest of my life, I consider myself an environmentalist and I um, recycled everything and I composted. And so just this idea that I was creating all this waste, I thought to be a real problem. So I thought, you know, this is plastic as that was plastic. So how can I use that in my work? And I tried making some installations and then I just began uh, cutting the bottoms of Poland spring bottles off, you know, the thinnish plastic bottles. Um, sewing them together with monofilament and because they're somewhat rounded they would you know they just turned into these kind of bowl-like forms and uh they seemed interesting but i didn't really know what they were um so this is um like 20 years or so after school and i'm still going to the metropolitan with great regularity and these were a couple of the pieces that i um 
that are my favorites. You know, the things that I love about these pieces are the, I mean, they're one, the craftsmanship is just exquisite, um, but they really seem to embody a certain um, humanity and a certain kind of grace. And so, you know, I would often go to the Metropolitan on a Friday because it was open late and I could just, you know, wander the halls and then maybe get dinner and then go back and wander some more. And I would always stop in and, um, or I still always stop in and, you know, visit my favorite pieces and then kind of just wander through, um, you know, temporary exhibits or, you know, with no, no real guidance. Um, and 28, 2008, there was a show of Mirandi, which maybe some of you saw. And it was like a really amazing show. And um, as I said, I've been making these you know, plastic bottle-like forms. And I thought, oh, maybe if I um, group them like Mirandi's, they would turn into something. Um, and uh, they didn't, the idea didn't really work. Um, the Mirandi's are exquisite, but they didn't really translate into my plastic forms. Um, and then as people were coming to my studio, they were saying like, oh, they really look a lot like Roman glass. And um, glass isn't something I had ever really considered or thought about, but I um, started uh, looking more at, um, at Roman glass. Oops, I just lost myself here somewhere, that's weird. Um, move that away. Um, so I began looking more at, um, at Roman glass and, um, and you can see this piece here on the right was um, uh, that is that pieces was on loan to the Frick in Pittsburgh. And so that's why that looks so grand. Um, but I began emulating these pieces. Uh, the color on my piece on the right is made from um, green soda bottles, Sprite, Mountain Dew, ginger ale. I'm cutting off those, um, those bottom nubs. There's five on the bottom of a, a soda bottle and then gluing them with hot glue around a form, then removing the internal structure and uh, using a material two-part resin called Magic Sculpt to kind of like a mortar to kind of hold it all together. And uh, it's often playing with scale on these pieces and I would you know, start and get a vague idea of the piece and then I would um, riff on that. And that piece on the left is one of my very favorite pieces. Uh, it's in the Islamic section. It is um, uh, that is the 11th to 13th century. But the thing that I really like about it is that you really see the effects of age. Um, uh, there's parts of it when you go and see this piece in person, you'll notice it. Um, there's parts of it that are like clear and um, kind of opalescent, and then there's parts that are really fat and crunchy. So it's just so interesting that kind of. Um, the textures that have happened to the piece over time. And then that piece on the right is a Roman piece from the uh, first to second century. And I like that rosette pattern that that has. And um, if you look on the bottom of a simply orange juice bottle, you'll see a rosette very similar to that. And so my piece in the middle is, you know, is sort of based on these, it is like has a squat body and it has a long neck. The body part of this piece is made from, um, uh, I can't remember if they're Gatorade bottles or, or vitamin water, one or the other that has that shape. And I, so often what I'm doing with these pieces is I'm cutting them apart and then, you know, moving them around and finding ways that they, that they can fit together. Um, the two glass pieces were made by a technique um, called mold blowing. So they would make a mold and then they would gather some glass and blow into the mold. And I'd be, came interested in this process one because there were a lot of these pieces because it was like the mass production of its time and kind of like the first century um so this became like mass production and uh then glass became more accessible to a lot of people so i was thinking these mold blown pieces are kind of like the plastic bottles of their time and i thought it would be interesting if i could um working with this idea of individuality or a unique piece as opposed to um, uh, like a production line or like mass produced pieces that I would make an original piece like my plastic piece here. And then I wanted to make a mold of that, hop blow it in glass, bring it back to glass, yet it would retain the, the marks of the plastic. 
but I didn't know anything about how to work it with glass. And um, I found out that there was a, um, a residency at Urban Glass in Brooklyn. And I applied for that residency and I got it. And um, so I made um, pieces like this one, like these, um, the two, so the two on the ends are uh, my plastic pieces. I think you can tell that sometimes it's hard to tell just on a small image. And um, the two in the center are glass. So working with a fantastic glass artist named Edison Zapata, he really helped me to, um, you know, I learned mold making and then um, we made, um, I'm not gonna go through the whole process, but we made molds of a number of pieces and then we would um, hot blow them in glass. Sometimes they would retain the, um, the marks of the, the plastic really clearly depending on different techniques that we use and, um, and sometimes, sometimes not. Um, as you can see, like this piece on the green, you know, it's kind of softened. Um, but as the piece, the green glass piece on the right was uh, the last piece that I made. And I was really getting excited about this. So then I wanted, I applied to a, a residency at the Corning Museum of Glass. And for my residency at Corning, what I wanted to do was work with their collection. Corning is, um, has a fantastic um, collection of ancient glass as well as glass from all time periods. Um, I had traveled there a number of years earlier just to look at the collection. And so when I applied for my proposal for the residency was that I wanted to uh, work with their collection and I was gonna remake some of the pieces in plastic. And then I would, um, again, make molds and then blow them in glass, but they would have the markings. So I was gonna like, in, a, in effect, I was sort of translating the pieces in their collection through the lens of my plastic pieces into, um, back into glass. And this is one of the images that I had had from a few years earlier that I was looking at a lot. And then um, when I got there for the residency and I was looking at, back at that vitrine, I realized that I was looking at a, uh, a vitrine of fakes and forgeries to explain the process of, um, of forging glass. So I thought it was funny that I was making kind of fakes of fakes. Um, one of the things that was so great about um, the, that residency was I would walk through the museum on my way to the glass studio. And uh, you know, there's just so many fantastic objects to be excited by. And one of my favorites was this cosmetic tube on the left. And um, in addition to the, you know, just you know, bizarre, unusual form, um, what I liked was that it was that this piece of pieces like this, not this piece, but pieces like this were functional cosmetic containers. And then this one became so over the top decorative um, that it lost its function. And so I was thinking about like the pieces that my two pieces on the right, those were vitamin water bottles. So they did have a function, but then as they became, you know, as they became transformed, as they became decorative, they lost their function. Another thing that I loved from the Corning Museum was this um, little four inch um, animal with a, the cosmetic tubes on its back. And uh, you know, it wasn't part of my, um, my proposal, but I said to the people that I was working with, you know, could we just, do you think we could make something like this? I really just wanted to make like an animal, something that had, you know, four legs. I said, like, I don't really care if it looks like this. I just wanted to have four legs and have like a vessel on its back. And they were very, very specific as to how they interpreted this animal. You know, we all went over that to the museum and we looked at it and they debated, you know, the order that the piece was made and like how they would reinterpret, you know, that little thing on the top of its head. And that kind of looking and specificity was really interesting to me. And, um, you know, now it's something that sometimes I embrace and something, sometimes I try and fight against it, but it was really interesting. And I thoroughly enjoyed that process of, of working with these um, artists so, as they made it. So they made the piece in the middle. And then um, after the residency, I had all these uh, 
three-dimensional pieces that were very similar to the museum pieces. So before when I was making pieces based on museum pieces, sometimes I would photograph them, sometimes I would draw them, um, but I'd always be making a three-dimensional piece based on a two-dimensional piece. And now I actually had you know, many three-dimensional pieces that I was looking at, which was interesting. Um, that idea of um, specificity then, you know, as I was uh, continued to work, I made my pieces more, more detailed. And um, this uh, Etruscan deer ascos on the left uh, is from the Vatican Museum. I had seen this piece in, um, in uh, 2011, I believe. And um, it wasn't until 2018, after looking at it for all these years, that I actually figured out like how I might be able to begin to approach it. It just seems so, like such a, a complicated form. Um, but sometimes these things, you know, they need to, to stew for a while. In 2018, I was really fortunate in that I was able to go to uh, Yaddo and McDowell and then took a trip to Italy. Um, like all kind of within the spring semester of school, I wasn't teaching that semester. And I really think in order to make this piece, I just really needed that kind of um, mental time and space just to, you know, process it and be outside of New York. When I was a kid, I loved um, this book, Learn to Draw with John Nagy. And um, one of the things I really liked about it was that you would make these, um, as you can see here, you know, I would draw the, the rectangles and then shading and smudging. And as first it would be just a geometric form. And then just by like finessing the edges, suddenly there'd be this great Dane on my piece of paper. And I feel sometimes like that when I'm making my pieces that I'm just starting off with these geometric shapes and they don't look like anything. But then as you know, as the piece develops and suddenly I have, you know, like a dog <laughs> looking at me, uh, magic continues. <laughs> um, so usually I look at pieces in, um, in museums, um, but sometimes things just come to me, like someone um, messaged me on Instagram, this picture of this double deer. And I had been thinking of, um, Dr. Doolittle and the push me pull you and I had been looking at a lot of deer and so it was just so interesting then that that arrived in my inbox. And one of the things that I really like about that form is the um, that is kind of compact even though you know the antlers are reaching up and the noses are reaching out it still feels um, uh, very contained. And um, I made a piece that is like that, that is more contained. And then I wanted to make this piece on the right where the energy is more pushing out. And one of the things about these antlers, so deer and caribou and animals like that have antlers. And um, antlers are often throughout the history of art, uh, a symbol of regeneration. I thought that was interesting um, because they, um, they grow back every year and they shed them in the winter. And uh, so this is an image from that um, Treasures from the Holy Land book that I purchased in 1986, the year that I graduated um, from, from grad school. And I was just flipping through it the other day and I was like, oh my God, there is that double deer. And you know, I look at that book all the time, but you know, you look at things and sometimes, you know, you don't really notice them and it I just thought like, so this, this image I think had been in the back of my mind for like 35 years or whatever that is. Um, and then also it's not just um, museum pieces that I'm interested in, but actual physical, physical animals. As Aaron said, I spend, um, I'm in upstate New York as well as in Brooklyn. And um, usually I spend maybe you know, a third to a half of my time upstate. But since March, um, we've been up there pretty much full time. And I developed this relationship with this deer. Um, in the summer, I would see it hanging around in the yard and it seemed different. It was not like um, 
know, didn't run away when it saw me. And then I'd be walking around in the woods and I just had this feeling um, that someone was watching me and I'd look over and I would see that deer. I know it was this deer. I and it would just be looking at me and like blinking its big eyes at me. So I watched this deer from being, you know, kind of young. And then I just had been watching his antlers um, grow. It's been very interesting. Uh, the piece on the left is going to be in the show at Tibor Dinaj. A number of these pieces, I can't remember what I showed you. Some of these pieces will be in that show. Um, and then um, unlike antlers, which grow back every year, which fall off and then grow back every year, horns um, um, are permanent. And uh, on these uh, mountain goats, um, I love the the shape of the of the horns, especially that one on the left. I just love that rounded form of the um, of the horn in relation to the rounded body, and then that rounded shape of the legs, all on this rounded form, within these horizontal lines. I just thought that was just like such a beautifully stunning image. Um, and same with this Sumerian vessel stand with an ibex in the. Um, in the center. What I realized about this one, you know, it's not only like the, you know, like the beautiful curves of the form. And I love that, you know, like just that subtlety of that um, rounded shape on the bottom of the stomach. But often when I'm looking at pieces, I'm looking at that exterior line, you know, like I, even though I'm making, you know, fully three-dimensional forms um, that have, you know, mass, I'm always thinking about, um, I'm kind of thinking about them almost like a linear drawing. And if the edge is not right, the, the, the piece is just not right. And so I'm, yeah, so I spend a lot of time thinking about the edges of these pieces. And with this form being so rounded, I thought it needed wheels. And this piece is um, currently on view in this show assembled at um, the, uh, uh, at Metro Tech in Brooklyn until November 7th. And um, we each made a piece that would fit into a two foot by two foot cube. Um, and that's uh, Courtney Puckett in the center and Daniel Weiner on the left. Um, during the pandemic, I've been looking at a lot of uh, religious, religious objects um, and um, Pieces that um, pieces that were made for um, kind of comfort people, or um, well, like I guess like like idols. <laughs> um, originally, when I was my show at Tibor Dinaj, I was thinking of calling it um, um, Muse, um, hence the title for for this um, for this talk. But then at a certain point, it changed to animals, idols, and us. And um, so I thought, I, you know, this part of the talk, I wanted to um, first talk about animals and then talk about idols. Um, so this piece, this Sumerian man um, was made, um, was a figure that would be, um, how to say this, a figure that was, um, would be commissioned, I guess, by an individual. Um, and this figure that would embody the um, embody that uh, that individual, the um, the human that it was supposed to represent, and so it was representing a very specific person. And it would be put in a temple, and then this object would um, stay in that temple and perpetually be praying to the gods. So it wasn't meant to be seen by people, it was meant to be seen by the gods. And um, there's a few of these, there's a man and woman at the Met, um, this man and, uh, and a woman at the Met. Um, and uh, so, you know, I just was, I guess I was thinking during the pandemic of like to have faith in, a, in an object or to have faith in a, that, um, just to have faith that you, by praying that you would be able to change your circumstances is a pretty moving thought, especially when things seem so dire. Um, so I began looking at a lot of these different um, uh, ceremonial objects or, um, or tomb objects. Um, and informally, what I love about this piece is the, uh, 
the detail in his beard and the detail of his hair and the, the shape of his arms and his clasped hands and uh, you know, and his, his dress, which I thought would be the easy part, but I kept trying to make it and it never looked right. And I felt sort of like this, um, I and this figure sort of both literally and sort of emotionally brought me to my knees and it brought the figure to its knees. Um, and uh, I just couldn't resolve it in it because I was still thinking about goats. So he, he turned into the goat man. Um, another idol, Anubis, uh, from the Egyptian collection at the Metropolitan. Um, you know, something as I was putting together this uh, presentation, I was thinking like, it's kind of crazy to put my um, pieces that are made out of recycled plastic and a little clunky to be putting them next to like some of the absolute masterpieces of, um, you know, of history. Um, so I thought like, be kind to my piece on the right, you know. <laughs> um, I, I guess I look at these things so much that it didn't really, I didn't really think of it as like, um, there's that and then there's mine. I thought of it more like, you know, I'm paying homage to these pieces or I'm, um, I'm humbled by these pieces. Um, and as I'm drawing inspiration from them, often my pieces, um, you know, take on a life of their own. Uh, the hand motions that Anubis, so Anubis is the, um, the god of mummification and the underworld. And in this case, he is, um, the hand motions signify that he's greeting the deceased in the afterlife and, um, and protecting the individual as they moved into the afterlife. And that pattern on uh, his, his uh, dress is um, supposed to be feathers. <clears throat> and this, um, this estate figure also from the Egyptian collection is really stunning. I remember I saw it in a, um, a temporary exhibit and it just floored me. And I'm so glad that it's part of the Metropolitan so that I can visit it often. Uh, when I first saw it, I just assumed that it was a, a servant of some sort because she was carrying a bird and um, you know, a basket with food on her head. Apparently it's, I think they said it was meat that she's carrying on her, on her head. Um, but I think the thing that I was mainly drawn to was like the way the, her dress hugs her figure. Like you really see the form of the figure, you know, it's like shockingly sexy, I thought for, um, um, you know, the middle kingdom, Egypt, but you know, what do I know? Um, also, uh, again, that pattern of her dress. So I thought she was a servant, but apparently she was a goddess. Um, and we know that she was a goddess because of her, she, because of the dress that she's wearing. Um, and I think her jewelry too is what they said. Um, so then you can see um, me thinking about this piece, how to make a figure walk. Um, I have a number of pieces that have been carrying things on their head. And I originally was gonna have her carrying a, um, individual, um, those uh, airplane liquor bottles. And then uh, I thought, you know, why does she have to carry a, a vessel on her head? She could carry anything on her head. Um, so I gave her a raven. And I also was thinking before I mounted this piece on a board, I had just been trying to make it stand. And, um, you know, I have other pieces that I've turned into um, like horses in order to make them stand. But in this case, I was thinking about how you often see in classical sculpture, a, um, a tree stump or a, a robe and that that would give that tripod for stability. Um, so hence the bull. Um, this Sphinx is in the show in Philadelphia, the Arthur Ross Gallery show, Rematerialize. Um, I had gone down to, um, to Philadelphia they had brought me down before the show happened to take a look at the work in the, um, in the Penn Museum, which has a great collection of ancient art. And with the idea that, um, that I would make something from the collection and that, that would be part of the show. And um, I was very taken by this um, Sphinx, which is sort of like the icon of the Penn Museum. One of the things that I really like about it is that the body is so beautifully intact 
um, but that the face is um, is worn because the face was exposed. So it was worn by years of sand. And also the thing about a lot of the Egyptian art that's really interesting to me is how they have been recycled, how this was made for a different king. Um, but then it was, uh, you know, the, the, um, the hieroglyphics were changed so that it would um, reflect this king. And then as I began thinking of sp Sphinx, you can't, I can't think of Sphinx without thinking of, Kara Walker's piece from um, 2014 that was at the Domino Sugar Factory, which I could basically spend my whole 45 minutes just talking about that piece. But I wanted to put it in here just to remind you of the awesomeness of it. And um, if you saw that piece, you know, to remind you of, and if you didn't, you should go look it up because it's, it's really stunning. And whenever I think, see a Sphinx figure now, I always think of this piece in all its, um, it's on all its audacity, I guess. Um, I think it was last year, the beginning of last year, um, my husband, Rick Briggs, who's a painter, and I um, went to the MFA in Boston. And there was the ancient Nubian show, which is really what I wanted to see. Um, so that's what brought us to the MFA. And then we saw the Egyptian work and we saw you know, a Sphinx in the Nubian show and then a Sphinx in the Egyptian wing. And then, um, we went upstairs and uh, Judith Lynn Harris had her uh, beautiful painting of a Sphinx in a flower garden. And uh, it was a nice surprise and a nice juxtaposition for that day. And then um, here's a Sphinx that I think will be in my um, Tibor Dinaz show. I feel like the Sphinx is sort of how I feel now, which is uh, kind of like wide open, eyes wide open in disbelief and kind of tightly wound. As I said, um, oh, I went down uh, to visit the Penn Museum and lots of uh, the Mediterranean area was closed for renovation. So they pulled a bunch of glass works out for me to look at, which was just a real thrill to be able to get really close to these pieces, um, you know, and to be able to really inspect them. And uh, one of the pieces that I fell in love with, love with was this Janus bottle on the, the left. And um, so Janus is the god of um, time, beginnings, endings, and duality. And um, he's always looking to the past and looking to the future. And this piece is so tiny, only three inches tall you know, that you could, it would fit in your hand. And so I just, I love that idea that you'd be holding this piece and you'd kind of be, to me, it seems like you'd be holding um, the past and the future in your hand when you're holding this piece. But then how to make this piece? It was, for me, it was pretty complicated. I don't have a, um, a background in any kind of figurative art. Um, and so trying to, you know, understand how a, a, a face is formed on those little figures that I had been making, you know, each one is its own sort of struggle, but then to make it bigger, it seemed it, like the problems all just got um, enlarged, you know, the difference between like how far the nose sticks out to how far the chin sticks out. And uh, also I had been looking at, um, at these uh, head vessels and uh, I've been looking at these Roman head flasks like those earlier mold blown pieces that I had talked about earlier. Um, head flasks are often mold blown and often would be representing an individual. Um, but I became very enamored of this um, Greek jug in the center and um, um, the hairstyle of that to the head of the Buddha, I thought was really interesting. With a lot of the pieces that I'm looking at, I'm, you know, like wandering through the Met. And I love that you can make connections between, you know, this type of hairstyle and this culture and time period and that type of hair culture and that, or, you know, like how they have fertility figures in almost every, um, almost every wing in the Metropolitan has its own, has a, a different fertility figure and what do those pieces have in common? Um, and uh, so wanting to um, try and figure out, you know, how really to make a face um, 
I decided to make it in the same way that I was making my earlier larger vessels by having a form to, to make it around. And um, I was thinking about those Roman flasks, how they would be um, often made for an individual. And I was thinking, oh, I could make this from a, um, like a mannequin head, but I wanted it to be an individual. So the easiest individual to work with was me. So I made a plaster cast of my head and then I used that as sort of the form to, um, to build my structure around. Uh, then it kind of looked too narrow. So it, I gave it these um, big earrings to kind of pull the energy out. And uh, the hair is like that green um, vessel that I, with the grapes that I spoke about for the same technique of those um, uh, two liter soda bottle for the hair. And um, this double portrait vessel, um, again, I guess I was thinking one about the Sphinx. I don't think I mentioned this, but you know, the, the Sphinx is supposed to have the, um, like the, the head of the human and then the, um, the physicality of a cat. So it would have that, those physical attributes that a, a cat has, um, but with the intellect of a human. And so I was sort of thinking about, um, with this, I guess I was thinking more about the, um, the, uh, the rationality of a human um, in relation to the uh, instinct maybe of a dog. Um, I had been at this meeting um, before I made this piece and you know, we had to go around the room and say our pronouns. And, um, but in addition to our pronouns, I think we had to say like our favorite color and our, who our spirit animal would be. And I immediately thought of my dog, Ella. Um, and so, you know, the secret is that really, um, this is, you know, kind of a Janus figure, but it's also kind of like me and my spirit animal. Um, I had mentioned in um, 2018 that we took a trip to, um, to Europe. I spent like a week in the British Museum and then, um, uh, then we went to Rome and Naples and, um, and Pompeii and Herculaneum. And going to Pompeii and Herculaneum had been, has been a dream of mine for, for quite a while. And one of the reasons is that, you know, as I feel as I'm making these pieces and as I'm studying um, these amazing pieces of, of history and these amazing pieces of art, I'm always wondering, you know, who were the people that made these pieces? And, um, you know, you can kind of feel a connection to them when you're looking at those pieces. And like as a, a maker and as a, a craftsperson, as an as artist, I'm always, you know, like I'm identifying with those artists, but to be able to, you know, see how they lived and how they worship and um, how they ate, this was a, uh, apparently a, like a cafe and that was like the steam table, you know, and I was thinking like, oh, like New Yorkers, you know, pre-pandemic, they ate out all the time. And then also like how they died, like who were these people? Um, it was really, a, for me, it was an extremely profound experience to be able to walk those streets. And I'm just going to end this talk with, um, with this photo collage that I made when I first began this um, working with these recycled bottle parts. Um, this was part of a, a public art proposal. Uh, and I wanted to, um, so in this case, I've superimposed um, or Photoshop my pieces into the Greek and Roman wing. And when I made this, I was thinking, you know, like what are future civilizations going to think about us and the, the plastic that we've created and the plastic that's filling, um, you know, the oceans that we've made and what are they going to think of about us? Um, but now things have become so dire. It's now not like what are future civilizations going to think about, but like what is the next generation going to think about us? Like what are the people that like don't have the ability? They're too young to vote right now. Like what are they going to think about us next year? So um, on that end, on that note, I'll leave you with this last message. Thank you. And I hope that we will have some questions and answers. Thank you so much, Sherry. That was really incredible. I really enjoyed your talk. And also thank you for the public service announcement. We all need to hear that. <laughs> I'm gonna try and, should I stop my share now?
So um, you can come back or? Yeah, well, or you could maybe even choose an, an image to show. Oh, that um, much more fun, yeah. I don't, I don't really want to look at myself personally. <laughs> okay, wait, 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 okay. I'm going to go back here and uh, go back. Oh, how do I? There we go. Let's find a good image. Anyway, were yes. there any questions? That is a really good one. Um, yes. Um, for some reason, I can't see them, though. Um, give me just one second. OK. Oh, oh OK. Catherine Bradford um, has a great question. Uh, since you live with a painter, does <laughs> painting influence you? Hi, Kathy. <laughs> um, uh, does painting influence me? Boy, that is an interesting question. Um, I would say that, um, yes. I would say that, um, boy, but how, I, it's hard to say exactly how it influences me. I think living with a painter influences me. Um, uh, I guess one of the things that influences me about well, painting definitely influences me. I look at a lot of painting um, and I love painting. Um, so yes, absolutely, it influences me in terms of color, in terms of texture, in terms of form, in terms of sub subject matter, all that. But I was thinking specifically about Rick Briggs and the painter that I live with, like, does that influence me? And, um, and yes, that too. Um, you know, one of the ways that um, the specificity of living with Rick Briggs and his painting influences me is that my work is very, very slow and it, you know, develops over time and it's kind of this like very, um, you know, kind of like a labor intensive, um, um, you know, slow process where it develops day by day. And, um, and there's a certain kind of like much faster energy where he has to really be on when he's making a painting. And so that um, we have a very different, we have very different processes and very different, different ways of working, but I draw a lot of energy from living with a painter. I love that. Um, okay, so Raymonda has a question. Um, apart from Morandi and Kara Walker, is there some other contemporary art that inspires you? You know, I'm so inspired um, constantly by contemporary art. I guess from this slide talk, you would think that I'm just wandering around the Metropolitan. And I do that a lot, but I also look at lots and lots of contemporary art. And, um, you know, when I first moved to New York, it seemed like, like I and all my friends would always say like, oh God, like the galleries are horrible. And, um, the museums have such great art and all the work in galleries is horrible. And I don't really understand, you know, like now I wonder like, why did we say that? I don't think the art was horrible. And I, um, you know, I think maybe we were like young and threatened by it or something. But like when I look at art now, you know, what's out there now, there is so much fantastic work. Um, but, um, work that I feel a kinship to in terms of the, um, the type of work that I'm making and artists that um, I think are exploring, you know, in some ways, similar subject matters. Um, one person is Sarah Peters, who also looks at a lot of ancient art. And, um, and another person is Michael Rakowitz, who I think is a, a real genius. Um, and boy, so like, so many others, like, mm, I think I'm being put on the spot, but um, those are, are two people just in terms of the way that I'm, that I'm working that I think of now. Those are, those are both great. And actually Sarah Peters taught a marathon at the studio school a few years oh, ago. Oh, cool, She's yeah. Amazing. I saw her talk, um, I think oh, it was yeah. last spring. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, 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 she, she's really great. Um, okay, so we have a question from Susan, who's asking, what art places would you like to visit that you haven't seen yet? Which I think is a great question, because I, I loved hearing about your, the sort of origin of your interest in ancient art and like where you went. So yeah, where else would you like to go? 
Oh boy, I want to go so many places. And that is like a kind of a, you know, yet one more thing with this pandemic that, um, you know, I think that that's sad for so many of us is that we can't be, um, we can't really be traveling. But um, yeah. I've never been to Greece. Um, I've never been to Egypt. I kind of kicked myself because I was so close. Um, and I'd love to go to both of, I'd love to go both of those places. I'd like to go to Sicily. I'd like to go to Sardinia. Um, I'd like to go to Turkey. Um, before I took a trip in 2011 um, to Rome, uh, someone came to my studio and she said, you should go to Syria. She said, Rome is always gonna be Rome, but Syria, you're not gonna be able to go there for long. And I've always kicked myself that I didn't go there because like some of the art that I love the most is from Syria and Iran. And so I'd love to go to those places. But sometimes I feel like really, like, yes, I definitely wanna to go to those places, but sometimes what I really think I wanna do is um, go back in time, not really change location, but change time. Totally. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Susan Firestone says, um, wonderful pieces, so transformative for one looking at them, amazing transformations. Um, and then she asks, yeah. what do they embody for you? Beliefs, wonder, urgency, or can that even be expressed? Um, beliefs, urgency, wonder. Yeah, yeah, the, the well, um, I wish I could just like get rid of mine and just look at the end, the Anubis over there. Um, so the pieces that I'm drawing inspiration from, um, yeah, they're, they're beautiful. They're, um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by them. Yes. Wonder. Yes. All, all of that. And then, um, when I'm doing my work, I like part of it is, you know, the challenge and part of it is like that, um, that, like that drawing process of, you know, putting things together and, um, you know, and, and I'm not sure if this is really answering the question, but like, but working through the pandemic, um, I have been so, I just feel so fortunate to be an artist. You know, it's been such a hard time for so many people and to be able to go into the studio and it's not like I'm um, not paying attention. I often, you know, sadly have NPR on in my studio all the time, but, to be able to um, have that kind of focus and that, um, and to be able to, you know, control something when we've been in this um, situation where we have so little control, and um, to be able to have something—I keep saying the word focus, but I mean I, that's, that seems to be the word for me—that I could really just hone in on making something, and um, and it was a, a real joy. It wasn't quite like you know an artist residency because like the news, it wasn't like escapism, um, but it was, uh, um, it was kind of like a bomb, I would say. Yeah, yeah, totally. I certainly identify with that. And it's been nice. It's been a good opportunity for artists, I think, to yeah. make something good out of these terrible surroundings. Um, yeah. So Lisa Kareen Davis um, asks, uh, I've never seen a big work of yours. Can you talk a bit about the size of your works? Yeah, um, I have made a few really big pieces, but they're, I don't ever really feel like they're as successful as uh, the more intimate scale. And um, partially that's because of the materials that I'm using, um, because usually they come from, um, you know, our household plastic products. Um, so to make something really big, I have to like put a lot of pieces together. Um, and it doesn't always translate that well. And I like the intimacy of being able to, you know, like turn this thing around in my, in my hands and that, um, that direct relationship that I have as I'm, as I'm working at, on it. Um, People have encouraged me to work really large, you know, and like rather than, um, I didn't really talk that much about the process in this talk, but um, like I just cut these things with, um, uh, with you know, good, basically like good scissors or with a jeweler saw, 
um, and I have like a mini hot glue gun. So I like the scale of my tools and you know, maybe it goes back to my training as a jeweler, right? Like I like the intimacy of um, being able to hold these things in my hand. Yeah. Um. Totally. Uh, so Kyle Gallup says hi and yeah. um, asks, what do you find you start a piece? Wait, do, I'm sorry. Do you find that you start a piece in mind and hold closely to your original idea? Or do you allow for the piece to tell you what it ends up being? How much room do you allow in your making process? Uh, oh, um, well, this, this piece on the left was supposed to look like the piece on the right. So I think that that's, um, you know, he wasn't supposed to be a goat. So that um, it changes, it changes a lot. And often, um, you know, the pieces that I'm show that I was showing in this talk, when they're related to something, that's because there is a relationship between those pieces. But oftentimes, I'll look at something and I'll get very excited by, um, you know, like a piece in a book or a piece I find, you know, in the in the museum and then I have this photo of it and I'm looking at it and I'm looking at it. And then as I start making the piece, it, you know, just goes off in its own direction and it um, is not related at all to the um, thing I started off making. And then usually what happens is um, I get very frustrated for a while and then I do drawings of the piece and then, you know, sometimes I put it aside and then it, just you know turns into its own piece and then you know I'm, I'm satisfied once it turns into its own piece but sometimes there is that thing of like I thought I was going there and I don't know where I'm going now and then you know like the form will kind of help me to um turn into the other thing yeah I love that um okay Don Kimes hi Don hi Don uh, asks, <laughs> asks uh, do the plastics you find suggest where you take the work or does the source grow more from the art of antiquity that you're referencing? And do you think of yourself as a political artist? Um, I think I I'm, I think that I can say yes, yes, and yes to all of those. Um, yes, sometimes the form does um, does help to dictate a. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember where I would find that. Oh, like this, um, like a form like this. Um, that body, whenever I see those, um, I can't remember the name of the brand, but there's a certain kind of almond milk bottle that has that, you know, kind of voluptuous shape. And I always think like, that looks like a, um, to me, it always looks like a sphinx or like that um, Egyptian dog. And um, so sometimes when I see the, the form, also now I know the bottle shapes, you know, pretty, pretty well. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll see one and I'll think, oh yeah, that would make, um, good hair or that would make like the shape of a head or, so sometimes I am inspired by them, but it's not usually that, um, it's more that the shape is in service of the, um, of the piece that I'm looking at. It's not so, yeah. So it's more like I see the bottle and I think like, oh, this looks like this other thing. And then I, you know, so it works that way. It's more that I'm interested in the, like in a Sphinx than in a bottle, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I do think of, I mean, I guess in some ways I think that, um, I do think of myself as a, as a political artist um, in that, uh, you know, I'm very concerned with the environment and I, um, and I try and make as little um, waste and be, uh, you know, very environmentally aware. So in that way, I think of myself as, um, you know, somewhat of an environmental artist. Although I don't like to say that because I um, also want to make what I want to make. Um, but in some ways, I think that just like, um, you know, making art is a political gesture um, for all of us. Certainly, yeah. Um, okay, so Jen Brown asks, can you speak about your color choices, please? Maybe I cannot tell the accurate color on the screen, but there seems to be many silvery or transparent pieces or subtle color choices. Also love the intense green. Thank you for your beautiful work. I really enjoyed this time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the, uh, the color, uh, um, yeah, the color. Uh, 
I struggle with color a lot. Um, I think because I look at so much ancient art, a lot of it is um, kind of worn down and I tend to like that kind of worn down look, um, the faded look. Um, I don't want to necessarily be making things that, you know, look like, you know, like antiques to hire kind of thing, but I do just, I think I've, um, uh, you know, um, just uh, internalized a lot of this kind of worn colors. And if you're in New York, yes, please do come see the show at Tibor Dinaj, um, because I think a lot, a lot of the colors are really subtle and um, I don't, they don't show up that well, I don't think in the slides. Um, but because these pieces are plastic, and I do like the fact that one of the things about plastic is that it's um, usually um, at least translucent, if not transparent. And so I, I wanna often wanna retain that um, translucency. And, um, and I often wanna have a color that, that you really can't name. I'm usually not that happy if a piece is just like, you know, sometimes like I like my green Ibex. Um, but sometimes when a piece is just a color, I feel like, no, oh, it's just a color. And I like it when there's some ambiguity that like, it's kind of like blue, but it's kind of like green. But um, so I guess I like that kind of worn look. And then I had mentioned just um, in passing that I, I tint the acrylic um, polymers and I use a lot of these um, mica powders and I like those powders because um, they have a kind of sheen and iridescence and that kind of seems to relate to glass and it kind of seems to relate to metal. And, um, and so I like that quality, but, but color is not easy. And it does, none of these, um, the surfaces usually don't come very easy. Sometimes I'll, I'll make the form and it's still in that like whitish stage. And sometimes it just seems like it's done kind of like um, the goat man, but sometimes I put a color on and then I live with it and then I sand it a little bit and then I add more. So it's a, a, um, a buildup of layering to get to the right color. Mm. Very cool. I mean, it does look so much like glass. I love that. Mm. Um, I mean, the play of materials in general is really fascinating, I think. Um, all right, so let's ask one more question um, by Beth Cattleman. She asks, um, one of the things I find so moving about your work is the contrast between the humble materials and the hours of attention you devote to making them beautiful. Can you talk about labor in your work? Well, that's nice, Beth, thank you. Um, labor, I mean, labor is sort of like that thing that I was saying before about working in the pandemic. Like uh, labor is sort of a, a refuge in a way. It's um, I like labor. <laughs> I like, um, you know, I like when, I like that process of making something. So I, I like just, you know, being in the studio, um, even if something is taking forever, you know, there's very occasional times where I think like, this is just so ridiculous that I've spent so much time on this piece, but, um, but you know, what are you going to do if it, if it isn't right, it isn't right. So, um, so yes, there is um, a lot of labor. I hope they don't look too labored, but you know, there is labor. Um, and you know, in terms of it being this humble material, um, yes, it is, and that is something that I really like about this material. You know, I like the the transformation from you know the trash into something that um, that kind of shifts the value of it. Um, <clears throat> so. I am very interested in the in the transformation of material, and I think you know, like that, you know, throughout all the materials I've ever I've ever worked with, I'm always interested in that transformation where it becomes something else. Like in the beginning, in metal smithing, like taking a flat sheet of metal and then hammering it into a shape, the um, it goes through this transformation. I um, mean, you, you actually change the structure of the metal into a different shape, and um, and then with glass too, I mean, that's like, you know, like an amazing transformation. In this case, like the, the, the actual physical material isn't changing because like I said, you know, I don't melt it down. I just am really finding convex and concave shapes, but I hope that um, the transformation happens um, like to the viewer. Yeah, totally. Um, 
Okay, um, so I'll ask two questions at the same time because they kind of go together. Um, the first is more of a comment, but it's lovely. Um, it's from Andrew Ginzel. Uh, he asks, um, perhaps do you feel that you are a ventriloquist speaking from the moot objects of the past, giving agency and a poignant echo? And nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then John Crawford um, asks, what a great talk, thank you. Can you describe anything about the shift in your work from your images? I think, I guess your own images, like, I think I'm thinking of like the sun piece um, to working from objects made by other artists. So using more direct reference, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. I guess like the sun piece and, you know, I didn't show them, but there was a whole bunch of pieces that were sort of related to that, that were about, um, like, like I said, natural phenomena. And, um, and while I was making those pieces, like I always felt like it was, um, I guess I felt like it was kind of like a coming out process because while I was always making all this other work and like trying to deal with abstraction and trying to deal with, you know, like how does one work with plaster and like, so exploring materials and exploring all these different themes, I was still going and, um, and looking at um, these pieces like constantly. So I felt like um, even though it wasn't reflected in my work, um, like these were like my real true loves. And, uh, and I was always envious of um, friends that, that are painters that um, like I remember um, Judy Glantzman, a good friend, would, I would go to the Metropolitan and she would look at paintings and she could really identify with the painting and um, with the work that she was doing. You know, so she, she could go look at like figurative painting and it would really speak to her. And I always sort of felt this loss at these things that I love so much, but that they didn't, um, that they weren't coming through in my work. So I guess when I started making pieces that were based on these things that I had loved all along, I sort of felt like, um, you know, some things came together for me and it was, uh, um, you know, I guess I was able to, uh, you know, express my love for these objects in a funny way. Um, you know, it, it felt good to be able to, um, uh, I guess have the things that I loved and the things that I was making, you know, um, become united. Yeah, totally. I and mean, that actually reminds me of um, what you were saying at the beginning of your talk when you were looking at that book from the Met and how these ancient objects were ceremonial pieces, but they didn't have any, you know, any, any, or they, they didn't know what the meaning was. So yeah, yeah, yeah. How does yeah. meaning change with these references and stuff? I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think maybe we'll do one more question. Um, Pamela Lawton asks, how important is the element of touch in your work and how do you respond to the feel of plastic material? Um, you know, it's funny that you asked that Pamela because I was thinking, um, I just was thinking about that. Like, I guess as I was getting ready for the talk and I didn't mention it, but I was just thinking like, God, these, sometimes these things, they just don't work until they've been touched enough. Um, I mean, I guess that also relates to Beth's question about labor. Like sometimes, um, like maybe the form is right, but I just like, I don't feel it if I haven't just touched it enough. So um, I know that one often talks about touch, not so much about actually touching the thing, but there is a quality of touch. But um, uh, so yeah, it develops some, um, it develops over time, um, the plastic material. I don't really have, I guess, any, um, any real, well, I actually I do, you know, because the plastic is sort of a hard material, um, kind of like metal. I mean, a lot of the things that I'm making are, are based on um, ceramic, which is a very soft material, um, very mushy. And what I'm using is, you know, is very rigid. Um, so I like that 
I like the rigidity of it and I like having something to, um, to push against and something to have to try and figure out how to put these parts together. And, um, you know, so I'm kind of working against both the, or working with or against both the subject matter um, and kind of pushing against this idea. And then also with the material working with and pushing against um, the material because it is, you know, for the most part, it is rigid. And so, you know, I have big cardboard boxes of all different shapes. So I'm always trying to find the right one. But in terms of the, um, you know, I mean, it's a great material to work with in some ways. I think like, why doesn't, why doesn't everyone work with plastic? Because there's so much of it and it's so readily available and it comes in all these interesting shapes and it comes in colors and it has textures and uh, it's easy to cut. It's like, it's actually a really great material to work with. Totally. And, and <laughs> we're so wasteful as artists sometimes. So I commend you for that. <laughs> um, okay. Well, Sherry, thank you so much. I, I personally really enjoyed this talk. Um, oh, thank you, Erin. Yeah. So we will, we will end here. Thank you to everyone who attended and um, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. I wish I could see all your faces. Thanks yeah, so much. Yeah. Very strange. <laughs> Okay, bye. Bye.